Coming up on In The Life, Dr. Matilda Krim and Phil Wilson on the state of AIDS. Do you think we might see a cure at some point? There will be something. We're going to be able to block this virus. A victory against discrimination. The government is refusing to hire him based on outmoded assumptions about what it means to be HIV positive. And HIV prevention on the World Wide Web. If all these men are online, maybe we should be online too. All this and more on In The Life documenting the people and the issues shaping the gay experience. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ammering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, New Paul Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you. Pat Lepore, Alan Berg, Ronnie Vines, Rick Schmidt, Paul Dunn, Michael. In 1981, Roy, a new Kevin virus that Lodor, came to be known as AIDS Bob changed the way Roy, society thought Darryl, about health, Melissa, sex, politics, Ron, Keith, nearly every aspect Marty of our lives. Story. In the Life began documenting the crisis in 1992, and with you, we have witnessed the changes in attitude over the years as we reported on the anger. Fight AIDS! The activism. Is a right. Healthcare is a right! And the grief. Rock Hudson, Eddie Peterson, Cindy Geronda. But there is a surprising perception among many of today's young people that HIV is simply no longer a big deal. Tonight on In the Life, the epidemic in 2008. The issues, the challenges, the battles, and the people who are taking up the fight. During the 1990s, HIV infection rates among men who have sex with men declined steadily. But since 1999, this number has been on the rise. In our lead story, we look at a new approach to HIV AIDS awareness in an era where more and more people meet sex partners online. We look at one effort that uses the web as an intervention tool to let people know that HIV is still a big deal. I started working in HIV in 1986, and looking at the data, it really felt like the 80s again. I mean, it was actually rather frightening. We did three large internet-based surveys looking at high-risk behavior in gay men and the relationship between that high-risk behavior and internet use. When Marianne and I decided to do this project together, I do remember some of the alarming findings. People were reporting that they didn't disclose to each other their HIV status before having sex. Well-educated men believed that HIV was curable and that taking uh, antiretroviral therapy would prevent them from transmitting it. So they didn't need to use any safety measures. It became very clear that to a lot of men, and, and many men actually used these words, that HIV isn't a big deal anymore. And when we heard that, we said, oh, we, we have to do something. We thought, well, if all these men are online, maybe we should be online too. The HIV Big Deal Project right now is comprised of three films. The first two are dramatic episodes. The first, the morning after. Every time we talked to a focus group or talked to men one-on-one, -on -one, we heard a million stories, but they all had one particular story in common, and that was that they met someone, they had sex with this person, and then in the morning or the next day or the next week, they found out that this person was positive. 
no disclosure, no conversation in advance about what's your HIV status. It's this guy, Eric, that I met. We hooked up about a week ago, and he, he IM'd me last night. And so I met him at Blink. And we had a few drinks. I play Josh. Um, he's kind of, uh, he's a bit of a party boy, I guess. He's had some at-risk or risky encounters. And that's kind of the first time that it hits him, I guess, that, you know, the, the reality of, of the lifestyle he's been leading. What happened? I don't know. All I know is that it was really intense. And this morning I woke up and I found a bottle of Multivere in the bathroom with his name on it. We wanted to make something that was very gay positive, respectful of people who have HIV, and but really exploring the, the difficulty it is in negotiating safer sex, in talking about your own status. Why'd you run off like that? But we had a great time last night. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what, what are you talking about? The pills, Eric. Eric is an architect who's HIV positive. I thought you already knew. Eric really falls for him and He's afraid to tell him that he's HIV positive because he's afraid that he might chase him away. And he thinks, well, if Josh didn't ask, then I don't have to say anything. You've been so concerned. Why the hell didn't you ask me? If anything, I should be worried about catching something from you. It is a difficult thing to talk about, especially if you don't really know each other, and especially if you've just met and it's a potential hookup situation. We have our character say, you know, uh, the one who's positive says to the other one, how do you know that you're not positive? Have you been tested? And of course, this uh, fellow has not been tested. Safe sex is a two-way street. It's not all up to me, you know. Um, um, I'm perfectly fine. And me ask you? You don't want to jeopardize the potential, you know, in a possibly good relationship. And you're, you're afraid that, you know, by bringing that up, that it's all of a sudden, it's going gonna, it's gonna to suck the, that initial magic out of the situation, you know? It's going to make it too serious too fast. Marianne to my knowledge, didn't find that men assume that a partner, a prospective partner, is positive. You get wasted like that. How do you know whether or not you've already got HIV? In fact, they probably assume just the opposite, and that's how they get into trouble. We found a lot of different learning theories concur that a change in attitudes is a precursor to change in behavior. And to influence attitudes, you must have an emotional appeal. And nice. storytelling nice. is a very good way to mm -hmm. make that appeal. Look, can we, uh, can we talk? Do you want to get something to eat or something? You sure you have time? I hear you've been a very busy guy. Yeah. Um, Look, I, uh, I got an HIV test today. We found that men actually, after watching the video, in the three months after watching the video, were three and a half times more likely to disclose their status to their partners. The future of, of HIV is still big deal could be more webisodes, um, uh, taking on different parts of this population, women, different avenues, different situations. One of our big goals is to get men tested, to get people tested who are at risk. 120 men were tested in the three months after they watched uh, the video, and 17 of them told us that they tested HIV positive for the first time. So that's 14 percent, which is really a lot. Having f watched this epidemic, having friends who have suffered from the epidemic, friends who've had friends who've suffered from the epidemic, having a good relationship with my husband and my son and their friends, um, it's, I just feel maybe kind of motherly about it. Many people are very private about their behavior and they, they don't want to talk about it with others. They may have trouble even admitting their behavior to themselves. And so the privacy of the internet, I think, is a wonderful way to reach people 
who may not be reached in other ways. In September of 2007, In the Life introduced you to Lorenzo Taylor, who was denied entry into the Foreign Service because of his HIV status. With the help of Lambda Legal, Taylor filed a lawsuit against the Department of State and Condoleezza Rice. Tonight, we look back at the case and update you on this fight against discrimination. Lorenzo Taylor sued Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice under the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which states that no otherwise qualified individuals with handicaps shall be subjected to discrimination. Here you have the government, our own government, that's supposed to be a model employer. It's supposed to do a better job than the, the private employment sector under the law when it comes to accommodating people with disabilities and hiring people with disabilities. And yet here we have this exceptionally qualified person, Lorenzo Taylor, and the government is refusing to hire him based on outmoded assumptions about what it means to be HIV positive. The State Department was enforcing a 1986 ban on hiring HIV positive applicants to the Foreign Service. It was a, a rational and humane policy at that point, but it certainly doesn't make any sense now. Colin Powell uh, came in as Secretary of State back in the year 2000. Powell had been running around the world talking about stigma and discrimination against people with AIDS. No stigmatization. They are just like anyone else. This is one of those lessons we have to get to all employers and nations around the world. We started to think that maybe um, this might be a good time to push for um, opening the Foreign Service to people that are HIV positive. Along with 15,000 applicants to the Foreign Service, Lorenzo took the written and oral parts of the exam. Only 15 to 20 percent pass. Lorenzo was one of them. Just to make it through that whole process was really exciting. Exactly. It really felt like I had a lot of people who um, had known that this was something I'd wanted who were there for me. It was really wonderful. Then came the medical screening. And one of the pieces they gave me was a form that said uh, HIV testing at the top. And the third paragraph down, it said, that if you're HIV positive, you will be no longer considered eligible for employment. Being HIV positive is one of several medical conditions that require medical monitoring and medication. You are simply not eligible to go to the most difficult posts, the greatest hardship posts. Therefore, you're not worldwide available. To have it put so succinctly and clearly it was jarring I and mean, it was really really surprising and i thought how many people would just have walked out uh, who are hiv positive would have just walked out at that point something inside me just pushed me forward and said i'm going to go through this i'm going to get through this i've been taking care of lorenzo for over 10 years um, he's one of the successful hiv patients and his viral load is consistently suppressed to an undetectable level. The fact that I can manage my own health condition and that I am, according to my own doctors and according to their examination, except for HIV, incredibly healthy, I think makes it difficult to me to understand the arguments. We're very sympathetic to, to Mr. Taylor, but at the same time, we, we just, this the principle of worldwide availability cannot be compromised. Leading a normal life in New York or Washington isn't at all the same thing as leading a normal life in Ouagadougou or in Harare or in many other places in the world. I was certainly willing to travel anywhere and be posted anywhere in the world that the State Department would have put me. My suspicion is that the blanket ban on new employees who are HIV positive doesn't come from the doctors. It comes from policymakers who have absolutely no concept of what the status of HIV is in this day and age. You have essentially two choices. One is to maintain a uniform policy that applies to everyone, or 
the other choice is you have a case-by-case -case approach. And when you're dealing with 14,000 existing employees and 20,000 who annually, every single year, take the Foreign Service exam, is that second choice really an option? They're trying to justify their policy by saying that if we let Lorenzo Taylor serve as a Foreign Service officer, we're going to have to let everyone else serve. That isn't what the law requires, and they know that. That law requires you look at the individual. And in fact, when you look at the individual and you look at Lorenzo Taylor, he can serve. It's a, a real 1985 mentality uh, in the 2000s that um, doesn't recognize the whole evolution in HIV healthcare that's taken place. So a victory in this case is going to be very important, not just for making the federal government do what it needs to do, but also letting everyone know that discrimination is still happening today and that it's illegal. Opening a door of opportunity to people that are HIV positive is so important and sends such a strong message to people that are living with HIV around the world that everyone is treated fairly and given the opportunity to serve. On February 15, 2008, less than two weeks before Taylor v. Rice was scheduled to go to trial, the Department of State set new guidelines. Foreign Service applicants will no longer be automatically disqualified due to their HIV status, and they must now be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Taylor now works for a federal public health program in San Francisco. For more than 20 years, Dr. Matilda Krem and Phil Wilson have been leaders in the fight against AIDS. In 1985, Dr. Krem founded the American Foundation for AIDS Research, and in 2000, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Phil Wilson is the founder and CEO of the Black AIDS Institute. Let's hear what they have to say about the state of the AIDS epidemic. Hello, Dr. Krem. Hi, Phil. It's good to see you again. It seems like we have to stop meeting this way. You know? <laughs> we should not. That's right. We should meeting. not stop meeting this way. Right. Exactly. It's always interesting and constructive. You have literally dedicated your life uh, to fighting HIV and AIDS. And at what point did you realize that's what it was going to be? In the beginning, did you think that this was going to be it? or Really, in 83, when we became incorporated as a not-for-profit research organization, we had a pretty good idea that uh, we were far from seeing the global impact, but it was, could be expected. Now you could tell that it was going to be something big. The potential for really global epidemics is there with HIV. As you know, because I've said this before, that you're certainly one of my heroes, and, mm -hmm. um, and you're, quite frankly, an unlikely AIDS hero. I was very lucky not only to have been a biologist who could, uh, you know, understand or see or study to observe certain things in a rational way, okay? Uh, secondly, that I was a woman. I was not a gay man, and I was ne ne nevertheless totally dedicated to this. And thirdly, that I was not a young girl. I was obviously a lady who was not talking in her self-personal interest. And the fact that I had a husband who was prominent in the entertainment industry, where he was respected, had many friends, and I could go from one to the other and ask for help. And of course, being able to put people on the air, on screens with famous names, and uh, the most famous of all those has been Elizabeth Taylor, right. who helped enormously just by being there. I would like to ask you a question about your work. Okay. What brought you to create the Black AIDS Institute? It's all a journey. You know, I got involved in HIV and AIDS in the very beginning in 1982. Um, and I found out that I was HIV positive around 1985, 84, 85. And um, turns out that I'd been infected in 1980. Uh, and so by uh, 1996, I actually had gotten very, very sick. And my yeah. doctors thought that I was going to die. 
And mm -hmm. so I stopped working. In fact, you know, the do my doctor had given me uh, less than two days to live. Oh my God. Uh, it was really that bad. I was in intensive care unit at Kaiser oh, Permanente okay. Hospital and my mother came out. Um, so I stopped working just as the time that protease inhibitors and the new you know, regimens yeah. were kind of coming on the market. So I started on you know, those regimens, you know, and you know, I came out of that. And by 1999, I felt like, well, I should go back to work. And so we decided that we really had to get black communities engaged. So uh, we started the Black AIDS Institute in an effort uh, to mobilize you know, traditional black leaders and black media and black civil rights organizations uh, to kind of confront HIV. We've trained hundreds uh, of people in the science of HIV. One of the things that is really, really problematic in black communities is the low HIV science literacy. That's right. Uh, and that's an important part of, of what well, we there do. There we go back to education. And the thing is that when people don't understand the science of HIV, they're less likely to protect themselves against the virus, of course. you know, uh, they're less likely to you know, access treatment. It's difficult for them to adhere to treatments. You now they're in no position to Im to impact policy. Knowledge is so important. important. Yes, people uh, uh, acquire self motivation by knowing. You know, then then education for safer sex makes sense. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I think one of the big mistakes our society has made is to be to make moralistic judgments about nat natural events. Right. Natural events should be looked with what we know about nature and a rational system uh, to analyze the events. Do you think that a national aid strategy is important? And what do you think it will take for us to develop a national aid strategy in this country? We used to have a federal council, right, an advisory council to the president on AIDS. And the first, uh, uh, they were called czars, remember? Mm, they right. were the aid czars. Well, one after the other kind of disappeared, and I understand the council disappeared also recently. So there goes the unit that right. was in charge of developing or maintaining a strategy in this country. We don't have it anymore. We have no excuse for not being able to develop one other than, you know, it requires political leadership. It requires political leadership. Uh, and also it requires a, a grassroots movement. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of lobbying in the early years of the epidemic, going from one office to the other on Capitol Hill, and also in the certain states, uh, visiting with the state governments. And <clears throat> I, what amazed me is that the people the high placed in government knew not more and sometimes less than the people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Important new strategies must start at the grassroots level and, and trickle up. Now I think, give us what you, your vision or your sense of what the epidemic is today. Recently, the CDC released studies showing that the AIDS epidemic in the United States is 40% worse than previously believed. You know, previously we thought that we were having about 40,000 new oh, cases yeah, a year. New disease right, it's exactly. 50, yeah. Now it's 56,000 yeah. no, new disease, and that's a huge increase. Yes. You now, 25% of HIV positive people in our country don't know that they're HIV positive. That means a conservative estimate would say 600,000 people are living living with HIV and they don't know that they're infected. 40% of the new cases among men are black. Uh, we see 70% of the new cases among adolescents and youth are black, you know. You see, a very important aspect of the disease and its control is to know where it is, who catches it, uh, how is it is, is transmitted, etc. And this we can know only if everybody gets tested. Right. And it's very important, even people who are unlikely to come down positive, they never know unless they are tested because there are no clinical symptoms to reveal infection. You've been at this for a long time, and, and yeah. do you think we might see a cure at some point? And, and what might that look like? Well, because I have a, a, a fundamental belief in science. I think, you know, it's only a matter of time, but we are going to get to understand this darn virus and know what it wants and what it needs and deprive it of it. And, um, and you know, there will be a vaccine. It's not going to be a vaccine 
based on knowledge of the immune, immune system as in the past. But there will be something. We're going to be able to block this virus. And uh, this is what makes me very hopeful. And in addition, people like you, you know, who, who work hard and are smart and know what goes on and do the right things. We tend also to speak uh, about um, data, about information on the epidemiology, you know, the spread of the disease and who gets in it, who doesn't. Uh, always l counting the bad situations. We count the people who are sick or who are this or that. We don't count because we can't count all the lives we have saved already. And the public should know that. There have been millions of people who have not become infected or have not died of, of, of AIDS because of what we have done in terms of prevention or treatment. That's right. And that should be, it is, in fact, very encouraging. Well, thank you very, very much, Mathil. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching In the Life. To sign up for monthly air date alerts or to download past episodes 24-7, please go to our website at inthelifetv.org or call 1-800-627-ON-TV. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Michael Billy. Thanks for tuning in, and please join us next month. Joseph Anthony Azar, Lawrence Williams, Gary Smithback, Ron Keel, Marty Story, Dale Taylor, Elaine Boucher, W. L. McCormick, Ed Carter, Daniel Davila Jr., David Hudson, Patrick McGuire, and a very special young man, Damon Embry. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation, Arcus Foundation, New Paul Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.